Can you hear my voice? Yes. Oh, check. One, two. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning, Jeff. Happy Friday, everybody. Woo! Woo! We made it. A three-day week. Strenuous, wasn't it? Okay, let's get things started. We've got some announcements. Here we go. November 22nd. Thank you. Uh, you can send all of your submissions to yop at bethlks.edu. Um, we accept anything from poetry, fiction, uh, visual art, original songs, personal essays, and graphic design. And uh, if you need uh, any more inform information, you can contact me or Siobhan Scary. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jaxi Gerg. I'm the Chief Justice and also the Elections Commissioner. If you could pull up the elections slide for me, that would be fantastic. Um, so as you guys may or may not know, if you never check your emails, you don't know. If you do, you might know. Um, we've sent out a couple emails about elections. We're looking for a couple freshman positions. Um, we've got a commuter senator position and a couple senior um, senator positions left to fill. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and um, in the emails we sent out some links to the forms. If you want to print them off, you can. We also have some forms um, in um, Student Life, and uh, you can go ahead and grab those. They'll be by Sam, Hain Sam Haynes' door, and um, you can turn it into Student Life, um, either to Anna Para or Sam Haynes or the SGA office. If you have any questions, you can email SGA or Jacqueline Girk. I put my full name up there because that's my Bethel email, so don't get confused and try to put in Jaxi. That won't work. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. And the due date for that is October 30th, 2019. And hopefully we'll be outside the CAF at some point to um, force elections onto you some more. So yeah, come out and uh, get some forms and sign up and see you then. What's up, everybody? Um, what's good? Um, starting on the 4th of November, we'll be starting a, um, a food pantry. And the purpose of the food pantry is to address matters involving food equality, food inequity, and the growing number of students who are in, new, in need of food or a meal. So the uh, food pantry will be located in the lower level of Hari Hall next to the ground level kitchen in the Hari Hub. Thank you and hope to, you know. Oh yeah, by the way, it's kind of an honor system. So like, if you don't need food, please don't just be in there just taking stuff. Just, Cause if you do that, it's gonna ruin it for those who truly need the food. So thank you. Two quick announcements related to Convo. One, as you all know, if you don't have your ID card with you, you do have the option of signing in up front. Uh, that has caused a couple of problems. A couple of people have taken advantage of that system and left because they knew they didn't have to scan out. This happened last year. The rule that was put in place was you have to sit in the front row or front two rows if you don't have your card. So we're reinstituting that rule. A couple of people ruined it for everybody. If you sign in up front, you can't expect us to ask you to sit up front as well. So that's one. Second announcement relates to Convo next week, which is a little bit different than the usual. Uh, if you've been looking ahead at your schedule, next Friday's Convo is actually a first year seminar plenary session mixed with Convo. Uh, so all of you who are in first year seminar know that next week you're going to be watching the film The Hate You Give, because you've been reading that book in your classes, so you're gonna watch the movie as part of your class. Uh, we are opening that up to a Convo session because it's gonna be shown here in Crable Auditorium and it's going to go into Convo time. So what that looks like, uh, is from 10 a.m. to noon next week. There will be no traditional convo. Instead, from 10 a.m. to noon, I'll say that again, it's a two hour slot, but from 10 to noon, uh, you all will be watching The Hate You Give in here. So those of you who are in first year seminar will be here regardless, you'll get your convo credit. Uh, anybody who wants to join in on that though is welcome. That's also a sort of an extra opportunity for convo credit. Uh, 
should be said, if you have a 10 o'clock class, this is not an excused absence. It's not an excused absence. Do not tell your professors that I've said it's an excused absence. It's not. Uh, that's something that you can negotiate, but not an excused absence. Your other classes take precedence, but it's a little bit different. We'll see some of you here next week. Uh, if you have questions about that, you can email Doug and I. But in that case, I will turn it over to uh, Rachel Messer. Oh, we have one more announcement, one more announcement. So next week is Halloween, and Bethel is having their annual trick-or-treat off the street event. So a lot of you have registered already, but if you want to pass out candy out of your dorm or help us facilitate a game outdoors, um, please sign up. Today's the last day to register. Other than that, on Monday, you can start picking up your candy bags in the Student Life office. That's in the basement of the admin building. <coughs> yeah. I will follow up with some emails. Thank you. Meredith and Doug got me a convo for my birthday. <laughs> I stole that joke from Meredith. Okay, we're gonna talk about Eureka today. Can I get the Eureka slide? Yeah. So the main um, attraction today is for you to hear from your classmates who actually have a Eureka grant right now, but I'm gonna give you a little overview of kind of what Eureka is and what your uh, possibilities are. So Eureka stands for Undergraduate Research Internships and Creative Activity. Please note research internships and creative activity. Um, this is literally for any type of activity that you engage in inquiry with, which is basically the process of um, looking at a topic, making some type of research question or um, creative topic, and then following through to the end of a project and presenting it. Um, this involves money. You can get money to do things that you might already be doing, which is awesome, especially for senior thesis work. If you want to look at examples besides the ones that people are going to present today, this website um, on the Bethel site will have some past Eureka recipients and what they did. So the awards are mainly the summer research grants. There are lots of different areas that people have received funding for for these grants. But if you do have a Mennonite emphasis or diversity emphasis in your project, you can be considered for one of these specialty Eureka funds, or you can just be in the general Eureka kind of consideration pool. So this kind of grant usually is to facilitate summer work, so it's called Eureka Summer Research Grant. Mainly people use it to get a head start on their senior research project, but we've had people who are sophomores, um, or even younger get this before, so don't feel like you have to be going into your senior year to do this. So the timeline is you submit an application in the spring semester, you, or you get told if you got the Eureka or not later in the spring semester, you do the summer work, you get a little bit of money then, like half your money, and then in the fall semester, um, there's a little checkup on your progress and you get the second half of the money then. Also, it looks great on your resume or CV. It's listed as a research award. Um, once you've gotten a Eureka, you might consider um, the kind of like requirements that come with it. The main one, the Eureka Symposium, which is in April of every year, you're gonna do either a poster or an oral presentation. Who's been to Eureka Symposium before? Yes, and you'll all be there this year too. It'll be fantastic. Poster would be the kind of trifold poster. I'll show you a picture in a second. Oral presentation is you're giving an oral talk in front of a classroom with a kind of PowerPoint screen like we have here. So it can be about research or internships. You might remember the internship panel that we have at Eureka every year. That's what we're talking about here. It can be individual or group projects. Lots of times you might work even in a class or a lab with some people who you're in class with. You guys can actually submit that project as a lab group to Eureka and present the core results you found, for example. Um, it can be part of a class, like I said, or it can be independent project that you're doing with a faculty member. And then some select seniors present at Combo in the spring rather than at Eureka. And there are some, a lot, actually a lot of other Eureka events that same week. The student art exhibition reception, the student directed one apps, or one apps, um, the YAP, sessions which are in the spring so lots of cool things this week in april um, the eureka week celebration of undergraduate research you can also apply for a travel award to go to a conference under the eldon rich fund um, this also fa falls under eureka funding we had two students that went to a 
conference last year got that paid for by the Eldon Rich Fund so that they could present their senior thesis work. Um, so let's look at a couple pictures if we can get those. This is what um, the WAC looks like, the atrium area or like the in-between area actually in the WAC during Eureka. We're having posters um, set up here pretty much every year. This will be much more full when you're presenting because all your friends are going to be coming around and asking you what you did for your research. And you can see that the formatting kind of varies, but essentially you're going to be presenting a poster to people who come by and ask you questions. So you might have a little elevator pitch to people, a squished down version of your explanation, and then they can be free to ask you additional questions. Okay, what about the next one? What do we got? We got Lil and Doug. Um, this is Lil. <laughs> this is Lil presenting her work from last year. Um, so you can see it's a pretty like face-to-face, one-on-one type of talking about your research. You can ask any of the people who have who have done this type of research here in the past. You get the best questions and things that you can like adjust on your project or make better just from these one-on-one -on -one conversations and the questions you get during your oral session. So we're gonna have some people talk the people who got their Eurekas this past year who are continuously working on it now. I want to mention that we typically have five of these to give away, but we're waiting on some information about that for how many we'll have this year. But please submit your application in the spring for this, even if you think there's, like a, for whatever reason, a low chance you might get it. Um, we really like to see a variety of projects, and the Eureka Committee um, is the committee who will choose. So it's Kip, me, Donalyn, and Megan Kirshner. So we're going to begin today with Sarah Balzer. If you know Sarah Balzer, where is she right now? Not in Kansas. So she is actually webcamming in, and we're going to talk to her about her project. And then we're going to hear from the four other ladies as well. Awesome. All right, good morning, everyone. I have been lucky, but it's been so good this guy. I am doing is a talk for justice and um, training. But for anyone you know, restore uh, provide do punitive um, in such when someone is so and what happened a bad thing the punishment. Um, and mostly um, it's around relationship book um, between offender and victim the offender and community that was affected. Um, so since I've been a Kansas Institute or Peace Conflict Assistant or KIP for um, has to do with training programs for teachers, uh, um, on how to integrate some of just to their school. Um, and according to kind of been in, in the program years, they haven't been able to get a lot of stuff about what's working. Um, so I put it with KIP Core, KIP Program Review um, of their training programs. So, um, you know, I went through the process, I took my application and IRB, um, my literature. Um, it's been a little bit of a different process for me. As some of you know, I was in Mexico over the summer and I am in Washington, D.C. Uh, here in the fall. And so I have not gotten as far on this, probably um, some others have. Um, but the plan is, uh, the next step is to send out a survey to anyone who has taken um, any of your any program uh, since 2011 uh, to get some uh, quantitative data from them. Um, and then I'll be doing some individualized interviews, either with particular schools that have really dug in and used restorative justice techniques, um, or individual teachers or counselors, um, whoever. Um, you know, is feeling strongly about this and has used this a lot in their schools. Um, so yeah, I'm really thankful to the Eureka Committee for um, 
selecting this research project. Um, I think that restorative justice um, is really important, especially from what I read in um, lowering the discipline gap. So that means that um, making sure like white kids don't get less punishment for doing the same thing. Um, and so I think that this is really important research and restorative justice is really important. Um, and I'm also really thankful to them because like I said, I, over the summer, I am in DC. Um, next, I have not been able to like have a job either of these places. And um, so it's really to have funding for the research that I'm doing. And I think that's it. Okay, um, I heard that it was cut out a little bit at the beginning. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, I'm basically doing, um, helping HIPCOR do a program review of their restorative justice um, in schools initiative. Um, does that, does that, did, I don't know what y'all heard. Is it <laughs> okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Madison Hofer Holdeman, a senior English major, and this is my Eureka senior project. Um, so the project proposal that I submitted in the last semester of my junior year was entitled Eco-Criticism and Violence in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, The Colonizer's Perspective. My initial intent with this project was to analyze Pride and Prejudice through an eco-critical lens. What I mean by this is I intended to analyze how Austen viewed the environment. She was a citizen of a country infamous for its colonization of others, as are we. I plan to analyze not only Austin, but also the implications for us as American citizens. I had also hoped to then take this analysis a bit further and apply it to how we as citizens of a capitalist country affect the Anthropocene, or the period of time we are currently living in where human activity is the dominant influence on the environment. However, though many gardens, grounds, and scenic views are interspersed in Austin's novel, upon further study, it became clear that there was not enough in order for me to do an extended eco-critical analysis. I knew I needed a new focus. I still wanted to use eco-criticism, so I thought of other authors I had read whose writing was influenced by the environment. I recalled a class I took my junior year that had largely influenced the original idea for the project, a special topics writing class focused on environmental writing. We read well-known environmental writers and poets like Thoreau and Gary Snyder. One of the authors I particularly, particularly enjoyed was Leah Papura. <clears throat> Papura is a poet, writer, and educator. She has four collections of poems and four collections of essays. The book of essays I read in class is relatively recent, published in 2006, and entitled On Looking. And in it, Papura experiments much with the environment and perspective. Because Papura is interested in looking and perceiving, both in human and non-human interaction, I plan to delve into thinking about her work with regards to perception and the environment. One of my sources, David Abrams' book, The Spell of the Sensuous, explores what it means to perceive. Here's a quote from his book. Humans are tuned for relationship. The eyes, the skin, the tongue, ears, and nostrils, all are gates where our body receives the nourishment of otherness. This landscape of shadowed voices, these feathered bodies and antlers and tumbling streams, these breathing shapes are our family, the beings with whom we are engaged, with whom we struggle and suffer and celebrate. As you can see, Abram's philosophy of perceiving is deeply connected to the environment. Using Abram as a guidepost, I plan to analyze Papura. Before I finish, I will read you a couple excerpts about a fox from the first essay of Papura's that I fell in love with. This is from her essay, Red, an Invocation. 
I remember the fox in the light I drove forth. It was just before dawn. The headlights lit the fox's eyes, who did not blink, but passed the light back so it shone between us. Two beams of dust in the colloidal silence spread and touched the dark brush by the side of the alley. The fox was ember-colored, fresh snapped, and already cooling. Red for the body of the fox isn't right, though when you look, as you might, for long minutes if you've never seen a fox before, not like this, so still and so close, you'd see not red exactly, but how the color is a form, recognizable, a particular concentration in hearing, a body signature reflex and decision, the barest gesture we know a thing by, and by which, in a breath, it is gone. The moon was still just a sliver. In the light I drove forth showed the fox's front leg held aloft, strictly still. It could not know if this was the light of kindness or a killing spot, and so with one leap, all deafness and economy, the fox slipped into the underbrush, wholly out of sight. As it disappeared, the tail of the fox was a wisp, a streaked feathery plume. As you can see, I'm still in the initial stages in my project, but I am excited to delve into the philosophy of perception, and I'm also looking forward to working with Purpura's work. Thanks. Hi, I'm Caroline Freeheim. Um, a senior psych major, as well as a um, peace and social conflict minor. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the process of getting the Eureka grant. Next slide. Okay, so uh, I actually got an email from Dwight Crable saying, hey, are you gonna apply for this? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I think you should. And I said, okay, I like free money. And so um, I filled out the application and then I sent it to Rachel Messer and Dwight to look over, make some edits, um, and then they sent it back, made those changes, sent it back in. A couple weeks later, I got notified by Dwight that I had been awarded the grant. I was thrilled. And so um, I received the first half of the $1,000. I got 500 bucks before I left for summer, and then the second half um, is still to come, assuming I continue on with my work. So this is an example of um, the application I sent in. Um, it ended up being about three pages, but it wasn't too bad to write. Um, so I have an introduction, kind of just talking about what my project is gonna be. Um, it has changed quite a bit from the initial stages. It was originally going to be about um, corporal punishment and their behavior as, what effect, and as well as the effect that different parenting styles can have on children. Um, now I'm looking more at corporal punishment and parenting and regional and religious differences. Um, so it's changed just a little bit as I've worked with it. Um, but I have a lit review, and then next slide. Um, my hypothesis, hypotheses, uh, methods which consisted of my participants who I aimed to get to take my survey. Um, next slide. My procedure, expected results, because I didn't have any at the time, and then uh, my references. So it really wasn't that much work. Um, just kind of a quick overview of what I was hoping to do. And so this is how I spent the money. Um, so I spent the first half of my summer traveling just for fun, uh, which left me with less time to work and earn money this summer, which I do normally. Um, so I still worked. I have a job that I can make my own uh, schedule. So I scaled back my hours there and um, worked more on my projects through the IRB and my lit review, gathering articles and uh, looking for surveys that I could use to send out to people. Um, so the money really helped compensate for that lack of money I would have gotten if I had been working. So this is what I did um, over the summer. It was just kind of like a compilation of all the things. I have a bunch of my articles there. I have a rough draft of my lit review started, um, my informed consent, my IRB. I'm using a survey that had already been created by someone else. Um, and so it's really nice that I don't have to, I didn't have to create that. I just use that and then they tell me how to score it, which is awesome. Um, and then I have that survey uh, and then the responses to the right of that. 
And this is what I've gotten so far. Um, I checked this morning, I have 75 responses in only a week, which is really exciting. Um, and the money has allowed me to scale back my hours at work here on campus as well. So I've been able to continually work on this um, and make sure I get it done on time. So a big thanks to Dwight and Rachel for encouraging me to do this, um, the Eureka Committee for picking me um, to receive this grant, Jared Kaufman, he's my minion, <laughs> he's been working really hard, and my friends and family who have been encouraging me to get a head start on this. I'm Casey Wilson. I'm a senior chemistry major, and as soon as we get my slides up, I'll start. Um, I guess I can start a little bit before they come up. So uh, my research is oh good is based on um, antibiotics and on antibiotic resistance. So the development of antibiotics is considered one of medicine's modern medicine's um, greatest accomplishments. However, due to overuse and uh, um, the natural ability of microbes to adapt. We are on the verge of basically exhausting um, our known antibiotics. And so that means we're on the verge of not being able to treat many things that are easily treatable by today's standards. Um, <coughs> antimicrobial resistance is currently one of the biggest threats to global health as um, identified by the World Health Organization. And so we need a new alternative and we need it soon. So some of you may remember Kylie Barney. Um, there we go. Um, she found through her senior seminar that wild bergamot, which is pictured over here, really pretty purple flower, native to the Kansas prairie, um, possesses effective antimicrobial properties. Uh, the chemical that gives it its properties is thymol over there on the right. And uh, this is a chemical that is present in many plants. It's uh, plant species that has between like 400 and 500 plants. So this is not just um, applicable to this one plant. It could be used on any of these plants in this species. And uh, these plants have been used medicinally for hundreds of years. Um, so just a little bit of chemistry because I'm a nerd. The ring here, it's the phenolic structure. That's what gives it its properties. It's also what gives it its smell. So if you think of thyme, the herb, or many other strong, uh, strong herbs like oregano, uh, this circular structure is what gives it its very strong smell and its very strong taste that's very distinct. Um, so it's also what gives it its antimicrobial properties. So we extract the thymol through a simple steam distillation. Super easy. This is just a little bit of the setup. Anyone who's taken organic chemistry will recognize this. Um, it's something that Organic One students do in the first few weeks of lab, so it's really easy, not hard at all, to get this um, thymol out of the plant, which is great for you know, re reproducibility. Um, <coughs> and then we're using HPLC, which stands for High Performance Liquid Chromatography. Here's a little schematic of how it works. Um, uh, to separate and measure the amount of thymol in the extract. So we wanna know, how much thymol is present in the extract so we can say, okay, we can get X amount of thymol from 50 grams of plant matter. Because if it takes 500 plants to make one dose, then that's not a good antibiotic replacement, right? It's not feasible. So this is really exciting. This is a new instrument to Bethel. We just got it donated this year and I get to be the guinea pig learning how to use it. So um, it's been really fun, long story short. You have a mobile phase and a solid phase, and it uses really high pressure to push the mobile phase, and your um, analyte, whatever you're looking at, through the solid phase, and then kind of like gel electrophoresis, um, based on how fast they travel through the phase, you can tell what's there. Um, so the goal of this research um, is to provide additional information to the feasibility of thymol as an antimicrobial, um, substance, this will be done by assessing the percent yield, so like I said, the amount of thymol we can get from the amount of plant matter that we use, um, and quality of the extracted material, so the purity of it obtained. And we are finally starting to get some preliminary results. Yeah, okay, good, the gra graphs show up. 
So uh, on the left, we, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, can you go back? <laughs> okay, whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, on the left, you have our standard. So this peak right here is where thymol shows up with pure thymol. And over here, you can see a peak from our extract that shows up at approximately the same time period, which is great. That means it's probably thymol, but we're gonna have to do a lot of research to prove it's thymol. So um, long story short, thymol may have the ability to act as an antimicrobial substance, but if it takes a large amount of plant to produce a small amount of thymol, or if that thymol is difficult to purify to an effective level, then it's not likely to be a useful antibiotic alternative. So that's basically what I'm doing with my senior seminar, and we're getting some good results. Hello everyone, I'm Kaho Yanagidaira. I'm a fifth year senior music and business major. And this is a research project for my business degree that is about music. The title is Ergonomically Scaled Piano Keyboards for Small-Handed Pianists in Japan, Implications for Marketing. And what that means is, as I'm developing a usable marketing plan for ergonomically scaled piano keyboards for Japanese piano manufacturers. And what ergonomically scaled piano keyboards mean is basically just like a narrower keyboards for piano, like smaller keyboards. And why it's called ergonomically scaled piano, ke piano keyboards is that like they actually fit hands better. And the reason is is that, so there are a number of reasons for this. So the current keyboard size is too big for many pianists, is what studies have shown. And women have ac approximately 50% smaller hands than men, and Asians have smaller hands than Caucasians. Majority of amateur pianists are women and children, but the majority of professional pianists are, are men, so there's a, like a big gender differences. And as, as well as ethnic, ethnic ethnic differences. And also, it also relates to piano keyboard size history that the current piano keyboard size haven't been the same since the birth of piano. And it has been smaller over, sorry, I'm just writing. So in the late 18th century and early 19th century, the span of the keyboard was diminished by three to six millimeter on average. And that's that's the keyboard that called been called ergonomically scaled piano keyboards today. That's like about the same size now. And the earliest keyboard spans are about the same as modern pian piano keyboards. But almost like all famous piano pieces <laughs> Compo were composed during the 100 year period that used small keyboard. So like a lot of repertoire are, were composed on smaller size keyboard. So that really creates um, difficulty for current pianists who play those repertoire, especially, especially um, like Especially in, since 1880, increase, it increased in women, the number of women pursuing performing careers as pianists and growth in Asian piano students. Especially in China and Korea, the piano is like, playing piano is really popular and there we see a lot of professional Chinese and Korean pianists so, as well as some Japanese. And I'm targeting Japanese piano markets because there are two reasons for this. Be one is because I'm native Japanese and I know a lot of students play piano and from young younger age. So, so children are forced to learn piano on the size that's, that was made for adults. 
and so children have to stretch their hands a lot, a lot, and it's not good for their techniques. And also, the other reason is that Japan has major piano manufacturers such as Yamaha and Kawaii, and this marketing plan is targeted for mainly the Japanese piano manufacturers so that they take this idea on. So the research I'm working is, I'm, I'm using this keyboard, the standard keyboard, and it was created by Donson and Donson something, sorry, I couldn't remember his name, but David Steinbuehler, um, he's, he, invent, he was an engineer, he, didn't, he wasn't a pianist, but he created like programming and made smaller keyboards. And the Eureka grant enabled me to travel to the place this summer. And I got to, got to play the smaller keyboards. Actually, for the second time, I visited there two years ago. Then, so yeah, so the Steinbuehler, they, this is, it's called the standard keyboard. Is this? So the top one is the current keyboard that's that you see everywhere, and that's DS six point five. That's the measurement from measurement of an octave in inches. The second one is the 6.0, 6.0. That's like a little narrower. And the bottom one is the 5.5. And a lot of pianists would assumingly prefer smaller keyboards based on like hand span measurements and stuff. The last one is, this is a hand, uh, that's my hand f to the front, the front, and the hand over there is David Steinbuehler, the, pr um, the person of the organization. So like there's a, can, can you see all the difference? So yeah, I, so there's a like, it's like really different. And I think it's obvious that in sports you don't, you wear the same shoes, like everyone wears different shoes, shoe size for to run and to get the most effective results. And I think it should be the same for piano as well. So that was the literature review and I'm still working on literature review and I was supposed to collect Japanese hand span data when, when I was home in Japan this summer, but I was I was too intimidated to contact music universities, so I didn't do that. And I found I found a similar results that was done by other people. So I thought maybe I should I didn't need to do that. But Dr. McFarland said no. I I think you need to do this. So I'm still working on collecting data from Japanese pianists and also non-pianists. So, but anyway, I'm very thankful for Eureka Grant and Dr. McFarland for supporting me for this my research. Thank you so much. Uh, somebody have questions. Uh, if you all could come up uh, to the stage, those of you who presented, and also Rachel and Kip. Uh, so if you have questions about how Eureka works, you could ask Rachel and Kip. Or if you have questions for your classmates on their research projects, we would love to hear your questions. I wanted to also mention that Akia hagen Debussoir got a Eureka this year, and she is doing her job in I think Washington DC, is that right, as well? So she couldn't webcam in this time, but she'd be glad to field some questions from you over email. What is the difference between a Reich grant and a Eureka grant? Who asked that question? Sorry. 
Hi, Capri. So I got both of those this year. So I, I don't think any, did anyone else? Okay. So um, I'll fail this question. So the REACH grant is specifically for like internships. Um, I know I got it so I could shadow over the summer. So it's less like research based and more experience based, I kind of feel like. Um, the Eureka grant is more like goal driven. So anyone who knows more than me, please correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm explaining this poorly. But um, the Eureka grant is like, I want to know this, and this grant is going to allow me to do it. So it's more like research based, even though it is internship or like creative outlets, it's kind of like a product, kind of, if that makes sense, or like you fulfill a goal, whereas the REACH grant is kind of an experience thing, if that makes sense. At least that was my, my experience of it. I might add the, the Eureka grant is available in all depart for people in all departments in all areas. Uh, are there specific requirements for being in Eureka? Well, in it, it, in order to receive a summer grant. You, it's a competitive process, and um, basically you have to convince the Eureka Committee that you have a project that, number one, has the support of a faculty advisor, because you'll have to list a faculty advisor, and you have to demonstrate that it's a worthwhile project and that you have already done enough research for it that you can show us why it's a worthwhile project and that it's a feasible project. So the requirements is basically just convincing the committee that it's that they ought to give you the money. Now, for the symposium, um, it's more it's m more wide open. You don't actually have to have received a Eureka grant for the symposium. If you've done a project for a class that you want and you want to share your research with your colleagues, uh, you could still you could still be included a, a, as a presenter for the symposium. Another question, how will this financially help me in the future? How, did, how does the grants help you in the future? Huh? Financially help you in the future. Well, the, the grant, well, okay, there's two, it the, the depends if you're talking the long-term future or the short-term future. In the short-term future, a Eureka grant will provide you with money that you need to complete your program. Um, in the long term, it looks good on a, it, it looks good on a, on a resume, on a CV. It's a, it is a competitive award. So you, will, you, are able to, you are able to show future employers, if you want to go to grad school, you're able to show uh, graduate schools that you have won a competitive award. And when you compete for other awards, competitive awards have, have a tendency to kind of snowball. And so, you know, you, you will be able, if you can show that you've won a competitive award, that will impress the people who make a decision for the next competitive award that you apply for. So it can help you while you're a student, it can help you beyond that as well. Hey, uh, thank y'all for being here today. I have a question for Kaho. I'm right here. For Bruce. Yeah. I'm right here. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so when you visited the, the uh, organization? Yeah. Company or yeah. Um, which size did you prefer? Because that's interesting. Because I have, I got small hands too. So I yeah, I I prefer DS point uh, five DS five point five the most. But there's actually one smaller called five point one. It's actually developed was made for children. And my hands it gets stuck between black keyboards because my hands are kind of thick. But um. The size of keyboards, like white keyboards, will be the, the best for me because I, yeah, I've never seen smaller hands than mine. So I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, six point oh is like it really you can feel a difference. So, as so well. do you think uh, education is institutions to implement different sizes as such? Because you think it could be a prohibiting factor to learn. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Other questions for your peers?
Sorry, I'm realizing I'm making a fool of myself, but did Jared enjoy being a minion? <laughs> Can he yeah. speak to that? Did he get to wear overalls and have goggles and be yellow? Okay, so, so minion is like a STEM term. They're not actual minions. Um, I, I know, Caroline. I'm yeah. sorry. So, no. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you get into the STEM program um, and go to that class, by your junior and senior year, you start working on projects. Um, and so if your senior year, you have a couple people, underclassmen, who help you. Um, with your project, data collection, uh, lit review. Jared's been getting me articles, it's really helpful. Um, so basically it's a way for um, underclassmen to learn how to um, do the project and have a couple years uh, before they get to their senior year of how to do it and they know how, how it goes. I think we have one more question over here. Keep me running around. This is for Kaho. Um, did, did you notice a difference, um, like when you played on the smaller keyboard, uh, was it hard to adjust, like to get things to fit in your hands? I know, you know, muscle memory, right? You yeah. sort of get used to the octave being a certain size and that sort of thing. So did that, was that a problem or a challenge? The, my answer is no. So the first time I visited the place was two years ago and it was, it took me, <laughs> Mm, like an hour to get used to the new size, but this summer I when I visited, like I was able to add, like it had been like a year and a half or two years since I played that smaller keyboard, but but I was able to adjust instantly, and I was also able to switch between like 5.5, 5.1, and 6.0 like almost like instantly. So it's like the adjusting is not an issue. Yeah. But did I answer your question? Okay. We have time for one more question. Or two, possibly, if they're short. Uh, this is for Madison. So since your, since your project wasn't necessarily like research-based, how did you format your application? Um, I was sent the application by Elizabeth Ratzloff, who was an English major <laughs> that graduated last year. And so she had done the same thing. And she was really helpful. She sent me the application. And she had formatted it differently. Um, yeah, mine wasn't mine wasn't like headed the same way that that Caroline's was. It was all kind of more cohesive. It sort of was so it was sort of like a paper of like this is what I plan to do. Yeah, I'll send you mine if you want. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Hi guys, thanks for sharing. Um, so I know one of the major roadblocks that kind of keeps people from applying for these kinds of grants or opportunities is thinking, oh, it's gonna take so long, I have to write this paper and doing this. Could you give us kind of an idea of about how long the whole application process took from like the time that you heard about it to like finally making a document to like start your, you know, written portions? So my application took me about an hour, like tops. Um, mainly because this is my senior seminar, so I already had all the information I needed because I'd thought about it. Um, and really, it was very handy because it kind of kick-started my senior seminar. So like, I had to do all of this stuff for my senior seminar anyway, and that was like my, um, my proposal to my teachers. It was the same thing. So I only had to write it once instead of writing it twice. You're gonna have to write it eventually anyway for your senior seminar, so I made money off of mine. <laughs> Same amount of time, approximately, I'm hearing. 